Our speaker tonight uh, really just is a, a grace man. The name of his ministry is Grace Life. Uh, he also was a uh, founder of the Free Grace Alliance, and uh, he's been in Finland and Sweden uh, with uh, the Greater Grace guys there in those places, and uh, Dr. Bing was in class last night with uh, Pastor Cannon's class, The Theology of Grace. So really, Greater Grace is really the place for you to be, <laughs> and uh, it's great to have him here. He's, uh, uh, where's Texas Greg? Is he here somewhere? Oh, I thought, he was, I thought I saw him earlier. Okay. Well, anyway, Dr. Bing is from Texas, so we have someone from Texas in the, in the house tonight. So would you welcome Dr. Charles Bing? Thank you, Steve. Well, good evening. It's a beautiful day it was today, wasn't it? It is good to be with you, especially uh, with folks of uh, kindred spirit and heart. Yes, Greater Grace World Outreach, Grace Life Ministries. Our emphasis is on the grace of God, I think, and we have that in common. And so I'm going to speak about that this evening um, from Romans. And I'm going to start in chapter 3 if you want to look there. Um, you know, one thing I like about visiting uh, Baltimore, not only is it in my home state where I grew up, and I get to visit friends and some other familiar places while I'm here, but um, I like to visit Greater Grace World Outreach, the, the college last night and the church service, because I see people from all over the world, from the east and the west, and uh, that, to me that's always exciting. I happen to be half Chinese myself, but my father was full Chinese, born in America, so third generation. And I just spent a lot of time in Asia this winter uh, ministering too. There are cultural differences, you know, uh, which are kind of tricky to navigate sometimes because in the Far East, you often begin a message with an apology. And in the West, it's awfully often tradition to begin a message with a joke. <laughs> so in a situation like this, I think I should apologize I don't have a joke. <laughs> and then I've got all my bases covered. But I'm going to ask God just to speak to us through his word. Father, we do ask that you speak to us through the word. For all those who listen, may uh, they hear what needs to be heard. And may you apply it to every life in the way that is needed. We'll trust your spirit to do the teaching this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like to talk about grace because it's a word that we use so much. We sing about it. And we sing the most familiar and popular song, Amazing Grace. But it also is a word that is used by not only our groups, but groups all over the world. Some groups that wouldn't even be called Christian in our category of thinking. Cults use the word grace, but what do they mean by it? They don't always mean the same thing that we mean. We live in a world that uses the word a lot, but often misunderstands the word. So tonight I want to talk about what the word grace means and why we need grace. Uh, grace is something we say over dinner. It can be a, a brown-eyed brunette. It can be uh, a dancer who dances well under pressure, we say is graceful. But what do we mean when we talk about grace in the Bible? And what do we mean when we read about it in a book like the book of Romans? So we'll talk about that. It's important for Christians to have a clear understanding of the grace of God because that's how the Christian life begins. The Christian life begins because an unbeliever understands that God has a free gift for them, and that's what grace essentially means, and that they can have the gift of eternal life absolutely free. But it doesn't stop there, because as Christians, we need also the grace of God to live the Christian life. We live by accessing God's grace through continual faith in our day-to-day -day walk. And so grace becomes everything that we need and, uh, and more. Grace becomes that which we don't deserve, but God gives us anyway. So I want to talk about grace and what it means today. And sometimes the best way to describe something is to describe what it is not or to compare it to other things. And as soon as I get the hang of this, we will... Oh, I see. We need to go here. There we go. All right. Good. One way to understand grace is to compare it to justice and mercy. Justice is when we get what we deserve. 
We live in a world of justice, so we get what we deserve usually. And that means that when we break the law, for example, justice is rendered and we pay a fine or some other penalty. If we work hard, we earn a paycheck, and that's justice also. We get what we deserve. Uh, mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. If you're speeding down the street and you get a ticket, that's what you deserve. But if the policeman says, um, I tell you what, I'll let you go this time. He has just shown you mercy. And grace, though, surprises us when we get what we don't deserve. We get something we don't deserve. And that's what grace is all about. Now, one time, uh, my youth pastor wanted to go fishing. So I said, okay, I'll take you fishing. And he said, I haven't been fishing for a long time, so I don't have any gear. So I said, okay, I'll loan you my fishing gear. Anybody that knows me loves, knows I love to fish. I loaned him my fishing gear, and we walked up the river. We weren't there but a short time fishing when we heard the sound of a motorboat coming up the river. And guess who it was? It was the game warden. And so he pulls up and checks my license. I'm fine and, and clear. And then he pulls up to my friend, Anthony, and checks him. And guess what? He doesn't have a license. I thought that he knew he needed a license. I didn't even think to tell him that he needed to buy a fishing license. So they actually have him hold against the tree, uh, <laughs> spread eagle, and they're patting him down. And they write him a $150 ticket for not having a fishing license. But that's justice, right? And they said, well, you know what we could do? We could take your gear also, my gear. <laughs> but we'll let you keep it if you stop fishing now. That's mercy, right? He didn't get what he deserved. Well, so we had to stop, and we were walking out. And as we walked by a fishing hole, we passed this fellow who's been fishing there for a while. And he's just quitting, and he pulls up a big stringer of fish that he's caught. And he turns to Anthony and says, hey, you want these fish? And Anthony grabs them and says, yeah, I'll take them. Well, that's grace. He got what he didn't deserve. He got more than he deserved. Grace surprised him, and grace surprises us. But grace is something that we all need to be saved. It answers the questions that we have about our eternal future. It dispels our doubts and our fears. It dispels our guilt by assuring us that God has accepted us freely by his grace, not on the basis of anything we've done, but because of what he's done. So let's talk about what is grace and why do we need the gift of grace. Okay, we look at chapter, we look at the book of Romans in chapter 3. And why the book of Romans? Well, Romans is really a book of grace. It mentions the word 28 times more than any other New Testament book. And um, it talks about how it applies uh, from the very beginning of our salvation right on through into eternity. So it's a wonderful book to understand grace. Why do we need the gift of grace? Let's answer that question first. Well, because God's standard is too high. Um, let's look at verse 21 and start there. I'm going to read verse 21. But, okay, let's stop right there. Good Bible students pay attention to details, right? And the first thing you notice about verse 21 is the word but is there, and it draws a contrast, right? Contrast to what? Well, what has Paul been talking about in Romans chapter 1 uh, through 320, through the end of uh, verse 20? He's been talking about the sinfulness of man, not good news. He said in, in chapter 1, verse 18, that the wrath of God is being poured out on the wickedness of men. And then he goes on to talk about the spiritual history of mankind, how we have turned our backs on God, ignored him in, our, in the revelation we have around us. We have grew unthankful. We didn't glorify him. We've worshiped the creature rather than the creator. And we've slid into sin, and God's turned us over to our sin. And we've gone deeper and deeper to a depraved mind and to uh, misuse our bodies. Uh, it's just bad news all around. When he comes to chapter 2, he addresses those who think they're better than others. And he says, you who think you're better than others, you're guilty of doing the same thing you're accusing other of, people of doing. And then he talks about the Jews. He says, you who have the law, you break the law yourselves. When he comes to chapter 3, he concludes his discussion of sin by saying, guess what? Everybody is guilty of sin. And he quotes this long list of 
Old Testament verses in, in verse chapter 3, verse 10 through 18, cite, citing passages in the Old Testament that talk about the sinfulness of man. There's none who does good. No, not one. There's no fear of God before their eyes. He gives them a spiritual examination from the head to the mouth to the feet and says they're all corrupt. Their feet run to shed blood. Their mouth is like the poison of asps and so on. Paul has painted a very dark picture for mankind. Now we come to verse 21, and let's read that word again. But, but now, you see, now God has done something. Paul is ready to turn the page in our spiritual history from bad news to good news, from black to light. What he's painted is a very dark picture. And sometimes that's necessary. We have to understand the sinfulness of our condition before we can appreciate the, the grandeur of God's grace. They say that the darkness of the dawn helps you appreciate the brightness. Uh, the darkness of the night helps you appreciate the brightness of the dawn. And so that's what Paul has done. He's laid out the darkness of our condition so that he can show us the brightness of God's good news. Now let's go on. But now, now, in this day... The righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been revealed. The righteousness of God refers to God's perfect standards. God has perfect standards being God. And those perfect standards have have been revealed through the law, a law which no one could keep, but now God has revealed that his righteousness is available apart from that law, something predicted by the law and the prophets itself. And that, that culminated in the coming and the revelation of Jesus Christ who came and fulfilled the law. And that's why he says it is through faith in Jesus Christ to on all and all and on all. To all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. No difference between Jew or Gentile. Everybody has to come to God the same way and have received God's righteousness the same way. So God's standards are too high. The standards of the law reflect the standards of God's perfection. 613 Old Testament laws. We don't know all of those probably by heart, I'm sure, but we know 10 of them, I bet. The Ten Commandments, which are basic measurements of morality. Um, when you compare yourself against the Ten Commandments, how you doing? You doing okay? You haven't murdered anybody, have you? Do we have any murderers here? <laughs> well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say, it, it has been said to those of old that you shall not kill or murder, but I say to you, anyone who judges his brother without a cause is guilty of judgment? So have, that's called mental murder. Anybody ever done that? Or how about adultery? Jesus said, it was said to those, it has been said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he's committed adultery. Well, see, Jesus defined breaking the law, not only the action, but the motive and the thought. Now we're not doing so good with those 10, are we? How many have broken all 10 commandments the way Jesus defined them? There you go. Join the club. And so keeping the law was an impossible standard to obtain God's righteousness. That's why he says in verse chapter 3, verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. You picture mankind before the judgment bar of God, and God says you are guilty of sin, and we just stand there without a word to say because we know he is absolutely right. Every mouth is stopped. And then in verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, the law wasn't given as a way to climb our way to God, as many people think. To get better and better and to try harder and, and, and to do more. That's never been the way that God has designed to save us. The law was given to make us conscious of sin. And that's exactly what verse 20 has said. It said... By the law is the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> when we understand what the law requires, we have to come to the conclusion we can't be that perfect. And so it was never intended to save us, but only to lead us to a Savior. 
kind of like an x-ray machine. I've been having some knee problems lately, and I've been to the doctor and had x rayed But, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't say, hey, doctor, where's the button on the machine that fixes my knee? See, he would say, there's no button on that machine that fixes your knee. That just shows you the problem. The x-ray is powerless to fix your problem. So why do we turn to the law to make us righteous before God? It's powerless to do it. All the law does is condemn us by showing us that we fall short. There's no righteousness under the law. And so it's like looking in a mirror. The mirror can't make us look better, unfortunately. It just shows us the problem so we can go do something about it. <laughs> the law shows us our problem so we can go to somebody who takes care of the problem. Galatians 3 says that it leads us to Christ. Okay? So God's standard is too high, and we can't get there by... But we can't undo our bad by doing good or by keeping the law. And not only is his standard too high, but our best efforts are too low. He goes on to say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Very familiar verse to you. And that word all means, in the original language, all. It means everybody. And in this context, he's speaking of both Jew, who thought he was better than everybody else, and Gentiles, some of whom thought they were better than everybody else. And it speaks to every person today who thinks they're doing better than everybody else. All have fallen short of the glory of God. When God looks down at the human race, he sees that some people can run faster than others. Some people can jump higher than others. Some people can do more good deeds than others. But in relationship to God's perfectly high standard of goodness, we all fall far short. Our best efforts are nothing to him. Our best efforts are too low. So what do I mean when I say our best efforts are too low? We're too much in debt. We can never pay the sin debt that we owe. We've sinned too much. We've gone too far. We incur a debt sin every day. We could never work our way out of that. I was reminded of that one time when I was in seminary, and I was grading papers for one of my professors at $5 an hour. And I had to have a back operation, and I was, knew I was going to be in the hospital recuperating for about three days. So I said, well, I'll bring some papers with me, and I'll grade while I'm laying there in bed, and I'll make some money. So when I was recuperating, I started grading papers. And then I started thinking, well, what did the doctor say this was going to cost? And what did the hospital say this was going to cost? And I added up how much it was going to cost me per hour to be in the hospital. Something like back then, $100, ten, ten times that today. But $100 an hour, and I'm making $5 an hour. That's the definition of futility. <laughs> that's the definition of trying. That's what it means to try to work your way out of your sin. You're trying to bail out water, but it's coming in faster. And so there's no way we can work our way out of the sin problem and sin debt that we're in. And then every good deed that we do is tainted. And that's why he says in chapter 3, there's none who does good, no, not one. Uh, you say, well, people can do good who are not Christians. Yes, they do good in a relative sense, but not before God's eyes. It's not a goodness that deserves or earns his righteousness. They do it for their own reasons, uh, perhaps self-righteousness or pride. Uh, but they do it in the context of rejecting Christ. If I ground my, if I had, my son was still a teenager, he's not anymore. If I grounded him because he disobeyed and told him he couldn't use the car for two weeks... But uh, a few days later, he, he walks in while I'm watching my favorite TV show. And he says, hey, Dad, I brought, brought one of your favorite pizzas. And I say, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. That's thoughtful of you. How did you get that? Oh, I drove down the street and got it. <laughs> well, did he do a good deed or not? You tell me. No, because he did it in the context of disobedience, you see. So when somebody has rejected Christ, but they do a good deed, what is that to God? It's still a big zero, big fat zero. And our idea of good isn't good enough. God's idea of good is perfectly good. We have to score a perfect score to be acceptable in his sight. So imagine with me, a man dies. This, you really have to imagine with me because this isn't really biblical. A man dies and he stands before the gates of heaven and St. Peter's there. All right? Uh, that's, the, that's the tradition anyway. And the man looks and sees it so beautiful inside. He says, I would like to go in there. And Peter says, well, it takes a million points. To get in. And the man says, a million points? Well, how do I get a point? And Peter says, well, tell me about your life. I said, oh, well, I went to uh, Greater Grace Church. 
And in, in fact, I would help out sometimes uh, and substitute in Sunday school and uh, served as a deacon. And uh, Peter says, oh, well, that's nice. That's one point. <laughs> and the man looks a little bit concerned, and he says, well, I, I, I also was a good citizen. I, I kept all the laws. I followed the speed limit, and I paid my bills, and I paid my taxes. Peter says, well, that's another point. Now the man's really growing concerned. And, and he says, well, you know, I, when my neighbor would uh, go on vacation, I'd mow his grass, and I'd feed his dog, and I, I opened the, the door at the post office where people are carrying packages, and uh, um, uh, he, he thought of everything good that he could think of. And Peter said, I'll give you another point. Now the man's totally exasperated, and he says, there's no way I can get into heaven except by the grace of God. And Peter says, grace of God, that's worth a million points. Come on in. <laughs> that's the only way that we can get into heaven is by the grace of God. Not by the little works that we do. Our idea of God isn't big enough. His goodness is perfect. And we have to have perfect goodness to get into heaven. So how do we get that? We get it by grace. Let's talk about what grace is. First, by talking about what it is not. It's not a payment for good works. The Bible teaches that if we have to work for something, it becomes a wage and becomes a payment, and it's no longer grace. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Faith is contrasted to works. Romans eleven six. 6. And if by grace that's no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it's no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. That tongue twister verse is basically saying that grace and works can't be mixed. They are um, uh, like oil and water, like square and round. They are totally opposite. The moment you introduce works, grace ceases to be grace. You can't mix the two. So you either receive God's grace as a free gift, or you work for it and nullify his grace. So the Bible says you can't mix the two. Grace is not a payment for good deeds. It's not a reward for good behavior. In other words, God doesn't say, well, you've done good things, so I'll give you grace. Well, then it still becomes something that we've earned, doesn't it? You know, there's this worldwide system of belief that many religions believe in. Even many Christians fall into this, talking about karma. You know, what goes around comes around. You get what you deserve. You do good things. Good things come back. And if you do bad things, bad things come back. You know, there is actually a biblical principle that follows that. You reap what you sow. But the good news is that grace breaks into that mechanical system of karma where bad always gets bad. Grace breaks into that system because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God breaks into that system and gives us something good even when we were bad and undeserving. And that's the wonderful side of grace that we get what we don't deserve, whereas the other systems are locked into it and they can't get away from it. Grace is not a mutual agreement. We don't make an agreement with God and say, I promise to serve you, and God says, okay, I'll give you eternal life. Or I surrender my life to you. Okay, I'll give you eternal life. We don't make bargains with God. You know, when I make a promise or a commitment to God, you know what I think God does? I think he laughs. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that before, Charlie. Um, I wonder how long it'll take before you break that one. I don't know about you, but I think I give him a good chuckle every now and then. My salvation doesn't depend on the commitments I make to him. It depends on the commitments he makes to me. You see, our salvation is, is based on um, the same grace that was experienced under the covenants, the Abrahamic promise, for example, when God said, I will bless you, I will give you a seed, and I will bless you, and I will give you a land. Of course, he was talking about the Messiah that would come, but it was an unconditional covenant. It didn't, it didn't depend on Abraham. How do I know that? Because in Genesis 15, 6, where Romans quotes the verse, it says, Abraham believed in the Lord and accounted it to him for righteousness. If you were to read Genesis 15, which we don't have time to do, you would find that their God renews his covenant with Abraham. He tells them to cut animals and spread them apart, which is the way they made a covenant. And the two parties would walk between the pieces and recite 
the conditions, like I'll do this and you do that. It was to show the seriousness of the covenant. So Abraham did that. He cut the animals. He spread the pieces apart. And then God put them to sleep. And then a smoking pot went down the middle of the pieces. That was God. And the promises were recited and repeated to Abraham while he was sleeping. That's what we call an unconditional, unilateral covenant. God made the promises while Abraham snored. <laughs> Abraham believed the promises, though, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Don't you think it's good news that our salvation doesn't depend on the promises we make to God, but the promises that he makes to us? God renewed the covenant with David in the Davidic covenant. Did David break his promises to God? Yeah, he did. Don't, aren't you glad that our salvation doesn't depend on David's performance? Well, neither does our salvation depend on our own performance. And so it's not a mutual agreement where we bargain with God. And it's not something that's costly. We have this popular term today. A lot of people talk about costly grace. And I think it's really misused because grace, by definition, is an absolutely free gift. It comes without cost. And so it's not something that, that uh, we have to pay for. Costly grace is, is a contradiction in terms. We call that an oxymoron. You've heard of oxymorons before, uh, like jumbo shrimp, um, military intelligence, um, honorable senator, um, government health care. Uh, I, I could go on and on. Microsoft works. Uh, I get in trouble, though, sometimes with my oxymorons. Costly grace just doesn't make sense. How much does grace cost? For us, it costs absolutely nothing. It's absolutely free. So it's a contradiction in terms. It's an absolutely free gift. And that's what verse 24 is saying, being justified freely by his grace. Now, notice what he's done here because you're good Bible students. You notice that there's a repetition. Repetition. He says freely by his grace. The word grace is from the word gift, so it means a free gift, but he says freely by his grace. Why does Paul feel the need to be redundant or repetitive? When we read repetition in the Bible, we know that something is being emphasized, right? It's important. And so he's contrasting grace to those who try to be saved by keeping the law and saying we are saved freely by his grace. Freely, absolutely undeserved but absolutely without price. But get this, it's without price to the recipient, but it costs the giver quite a bit. Look at the rest of the verse. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word redemption speaks of a price that was paid. God paid the ultimate price, the most valuable price he could find in the whole universe, his son, and gave his son for us so that we could receive salvation freely. Isn't that amazing? That God would do that? Not only that he would do that, but that he would suffer so. Now, you think I'm talking about suffering the nails and the beating, don't you? I'm really talking about more than that. I'm talking about a suffering that we couldn't comprehend, really, because when he died on the cross, it wasn't just the physical suffering that he carried with him. It was the suffering for my sins. Do you know how many sins I've committed? I hope you don't. <laughs> but God does, and he put them on Jesus. And that was quite a burden for him. Do you know how many sins Pastor John has committed? He took John's too. And then he, took, he even took Pastor's, Pastor Schaller's sins and Pastor Steve's sins. And guess what? He took yours too. And that's what, that's what hurt more than the nails and more than the spear was the weight of our sins on him. And when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had turned his back on his son for the first time in an eternal relationship so that he could bear our sins. And that's an agony you and I will never, ever understand. And then he died on the cross and he said, it is finished. What's finished? The payment for our sins is finished. What sins? The sins that I committed yesterday? Yes, absolutely, we know that. The sins I committed today? Yeah. But what about tomorrow's sins? Were they covered too? That's hard to believe that God would die for sins I haven't yet committed. But let me ask you this. How many of your sins were future when Jesus died on the cross? All of them, right? 
Okay, so he died for all of your sins, even the things that you don't know you're going to do tomorrow. But God knows you're going to do them, and he said, I'll cover them on the cross. And there's never going to be a moment when it says, oh, no, I'm sorry I saved Joe. I didn't know he was going to do that. <laughs> God's not going to be surprised. By the worst things that we have done, the worst things that we might do, they're all covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Now you say, Charlie, if you teach that kind of grace, then people are going to go out and they're going to sin and do whatever they want to. Well, they might choose to do that. I've not met, I don't think I've met anybody that's ever said they're going to do that. But what I have met is thousands and thousands of people who said, man, that is so great. I want to tell other people about it. And I want to serve that kind of God. And I want to teach about that kind of God. And I want to learn more about that kind of God that would take my sins upon himself like that. He died not only for our past sins, our but our present and our future sins as well. And then verse 25 closes this section by talking about God setting forth Jesus Christ as a propitiation, uh, a covering for our sins to appease God's justice so, so that God could demonstrate his righteousness. In the past, his forbearance, he, he had passed over the sins that were previously committed. In other words, Israel had to offer regular sacrifices to satisfy God's justice until the ultimate sacrifice and payment was made. Kind of like making your mortgage payment on your house so you can tell people you own a house or own a car, but you don't really. The bank owns it. But if you were to pay it all off, then it would truly be yours. Israel made down payments on their salvation, made monthly deposits, yearly deposits. Jesus Christ came and made the eternal sacrifice and secured our salvation once and for all and sat down at the right hand of God because the work was finished. There was nothing else that could be done. And think, it's a mistake to think that we could add anything to what God has done. When Jesus died on the cross, he meant it was finished. And so the righteousness of God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. What does faith mean? Faith is the persuasion that something is true. It's taking God at his word and believing it to be true. It's kind of like going, you got a disease that you can't pronounce. You go to a doctor you hardly know. He writes you a prescription you can't read. You take it to a pharmacist you've never met. He gives you a drug that you can't pronounce again. But it says, take one and you'll get better. <laughs> now that you understand. So you believe that word and you get better. That's what faith simply is. It's taking God at his word. He promises eternal life to those who believe in Jesus Christ, his son, as their savior from sin. Because he died and he rose again. And if we will accept that promise of eternal life through him, our sins are forgiven and eternal life is ours. And so there are really only two religions in the world. Those who try to earn their way to heaven and those who simply receive it as a free gift of God. It's that simple. I'm a simple person. Two religions in the world. Those that have lists and those that have Christ. Have you been working on a list? Or are you trusting in Christ? Have you been trying to do good, keep the law, reform yourself, keep your New Year's resolutions, break the old habits, start the new habits? All those lists will not earn you eternal life. You have to come to God through faith with an empty hand and say, Lord, I have nothing to bring, but I do believe your promise that you love me enough to give me eternal life. Faith is the way we receive the free gift of God called grace. So grace, grace is absolutely free, something that we don't deserve at all. And when we realize that, it surprises us. It's too good almost to be true because we never get something for nothing. And it's so good that millions miss it. They just can't believe that they would get such a wonderful gift from God. But how about you this evening? I wonder if there's anyone here tonight who's been struggling with doubts and wondering if God has accepted them or wondering if you measure up. Well, you don't measure up, and you never will. Only Jesus measures up. And God's not going to grade you on the basis of your performance. He's not even going to grade you on the curve. He's going to grade you on the cross and what was done there. And if you're trusting in what Jesus has done tonight, you can have eternal life. It can be yours, and your doubts can cease. Your deepest and darkest sins can be forgiven. Your life can be new. You can get a new start, a new joy, a new relationship with God. That's what grace does for us.
Can I pray with you as we close this evening? And I especially am burdened for those who have been living with some doubts and insecurities about their eternal life. So I'd like you to bow your heads and pray with me if you have any doubt about your eternal security. If you were to drive out of here today and get hit by a car and, and die, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? Well, you can know tonight by just trusting in Jesus Christ and what he has done for you and the promise that he makes to give you eternal life. I wonder if there's anyone here who can say, tonight, for the first time, I'm going to cease trusting in my own effort, and I'm going to receive the gift of God by believing in Jesus Christ. If you can say that for the first time tonight, would you just raise your hand so we can see who you are and rejoice with you? And not only that, but the pastors here would have some literature for you to get you started on the right track. If you would say tonight, I am believing in Jesus Christ for the first time as my Savior, and I'm going to take him at his word for eternal life and stop trying to earn it. Just stick your hand up quickly and put it down, and your pastors will find you. Is there anyone? Well, Lord, I want to thank you for the wonderful grace of God and the assurance that, it, that is ours that we have eternal life, and that means forever. And that your gifts you do not take back. They're irrevocable. And that you have loved us so much to give us that eternal life through Jesus Christ. Father, grace truly is amazing. And it truly is surprising to us that there's a God who would love us so much. May we live our lives in gratitude then for all that we've received. And return the love that we've, we've experienced from you. And may our lives just be a big thank you note for all that God has done for all that you have done by your grace that we didn't deserve. And I thank you for this church that proclaims the grace of God. May they continue to live and proclaim that grace, and may your grace and peace be upon them and upon every person in the hearing of your word this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.